Hi, I'm Anna Steisling with Great Lakes Now, and I'm joined by Cheryl Porter, Chief Operating Officer of Water and Field Services at the Great Lakes Water Authority and President of the American Water Works Association. Cheryl made history by becoming the first African-American president of the AWWA earlier this year, and she is also the first woman of color to hold this position. Cheryl brings 28 years of experience in the water sector to this role, beginning as a junior chemist at the city of Detroit in 1996 and advancing through several leadership roles, including chief customer service officer and chief operating officer. And she was part of the leadership team that helped establish the GLWA in 2016. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. So, so to get started, talk to me a little bit about just sort of briefly your background and how you got here um, in this moment in your career and specifically, you know, in this new leadership position for AWWA. Well, I often tell my water story this way. Water kind of found me. Um, when I graduated from uh, the University of Michigan with a chemistry degree, uh, when I went into that field, I was thinking I wanted to be a doctor. Um, Decided enough school, <laughs> so I went out and got a job. I uh, worked at a small solvents company for a minute, and then I found my way over to the Detroit Water and Sewage Department as a junior chemist. And I've always wanted to give back or have some contribution back to uh, my community and to the world. And when I realized as a chemist working in the lab that I was responsible for that water that was being distributed to my friends, my family, my neighborhood, uh, that gave me a real sense of community and, and the fact that even though people may not recognize it or know it, I was giving back. And and that just um, resonated with me in such a way that whatever I could do to help out in the water sector, uh, what went from quickly being a job became a career and something that... Uh, the advancement opportunities were there because I, I liked fixing things. I liked finding operational efficiencies and, and that created opportunities for me uh, to advance within uh, not only the Detroit system, but also to move over to the regional authority as the chief operating officer. So it's very exciting. Um, I didn't expect to be in the service sector for 28 years, but it just so happens that it worked out. And it is such an honor and a privilege to be a, uh, the president of our association. Um, 143 years that this association has been in existence, focused on you know, improving water and bringing water professionals together so that we can network and help each other. And it, it is such an honor to be in that leadership role. Cool. So Cheryl, I want to ask you a little bit about some of the strategies and goals for your term in this leadership position. But I think before we get into that, I'm just thinking about the the wide variety of folks who tune in to Great Lakes now, both the monthly show and all of our web and digital content. And there are so many different um, interests and different things that people sort of come to us for. And for folks who are watching this, who maybe don't know a whole lot about you know, the sort of like professional water sector, to someone who's never heard of AWWA, how would you define and describe the organization and the work that you do? Well, you know, AWWA is um, uh, an international uh, association of water professionals who, and you're talking about folks who work in utilities, you're talking about manufacturers or consultants or engineering forms that help, help support water utilities. They are also involved. You're even talking about academics who uh, can use water as their basis for doing research. So you're bringing all of this water community together through the association to really problem solve and strategize strategize and, and just keep an eye on what our future is and how we are going to influence that future. Um, oftentimes, especially in the United States, we have this, this great advantage of having safe drinking water in our homes. Uh, and 
you know, until something's wrong, people usually don't think about us. So we are trying to shift that and, and get more engaged with our communities to let them know that we exist, that we are here providing that service uh, and, and supplying their homes with water and also taking that water that's leaving their homes, treating it and making sure that we're safely putting it back into the environment. And so that entire water uh, cycle is what water utility professionals are involved in and um, what I've had the privilege of being involved in. Cool. Thanks for defining that and sort of breaking it down a little bit. So, okay. Something that I've heard you say before is a better world with better water. So you kind of just said, you know, the United States were certainly from a sort of global perspective in a really privileged position for the most part in terms of our water safety and quality. But I wonder like in talking about strategies and goals for your term, um, how are you thinking about like ways that you might be able to like improve the water um, or what kind of work the AWWA um, sets out to do for the for the time where you're sort of, you know, in this position? I in my term, I'd really like to spend some time um, allowing people to connect with water to have their own individual uh, connection with water because that means that they will be vested in protecting this vital resource that we have in the ways that they can do it. So uh, that they are thoughtful about how they garden um, and how they use fertilizers because that eventually can get into uh, water systems. And what we are discovering as we are moving forward in the future, it is so much easier to keep things out of our water sources rather than to try to figure out how to treat them out. Even though we're tasked with that and we still do that and we spend time figuring out how to address emerging contaminants as they surface, we look at the basics that we need to do to ensure that quality and we want to share what we've learned with the rest of the world so that they can have this, the same type of systems that we've created to have that exchange of information and knowledge so that people are supplying this vital resource to life through globally we we want to have that kind of influence and impact and we want to learn also what others are doing um uh, it, so oftentimes when people are faced with a struggle they come up with very innovative ways on how to address those and sharing that and exchanging that kind of information is really what the association is all about Absolutely. And, you know, I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, I know that this work isn't necessarily just all like sunshine, rainbows and easy. So I want to get into <laughs> sort of, you know, the day to day challenges that you're up against. But you did just mention, you know, the fact that there, there is some real imagination and really exciting stuff happening. Um, when we think about, you know, the sort of holistic models of the water cycle and the ways that, um, you know, certainly I think different environmental justice frontline communities are having to really be really imaginative in coming up with solutions that are um, sort of, you know, proactive and addressing yes. the issues playing out right there outside their front door. So I want to kind of pivot and ask you a little bit to, you know, talk more about that. What are you seeing that has you feeling excited and hopeful about um, the ways that folks are thinking about about water infrastructure and the water cycle. You know, what's fascinating when we are, um, we do have challenges and I'm going to talk about some of my personal challenges as a water utility professional. But if I was to talk about the top three uh, things that rise to uh, a level of concern for the water professionals, I'd have to say it's protecting our sources, it's our aging infrastructure and having the funding to invest in that aging infrastructure. And one of the things that we have discovered, you're right, people usually don't know we exist until something is drastically wrong. And so um, at uh, the, I, I work for a wholesale provider the, at the Great Lakes Water Authority, and uh, we had our largest transmission main break. And it took one of our water treatment plants, we have five, it took one of our water treatment plants out of service. 
And in going through that experience and trying to provide this water service to people as we were working behind the scenes to fix the repair, to put that, that water treatment plant back online, we were able to deploy some technologies that we're using. None of us have enough money to just replace all of our aged infrastructure. And when it, when it comes to our pipes, one of the exciting things is that technology has surfaced in a way that it's allowing us to assess how those pipes are doing. And as they are aging, maybe even deploying technology that can indicate to us, hey, this pipe is, is on the verge of failure. You need to go and address that. So we are uh, engaged with these innovative technologies in our system and having them help us find very strategic ways of investing in our infrastructure. And that helps with the affordability issue because, again, nobody can afford to go in and just change everything out and make it new. Uh, and when we built these things, we weren't necessarily thinking about how to maintain them or, you know, people usually don't think beyond their life uh, span. So that's the one thing I do like about the water professional, because I do have to think beyond me. I have to think about how is this going to survive and be effective for those future generations who are coming behind me and making sure that we uh, engage them in such a way that they want to be a part of our profession because we do have some workforce challenges too. Uh, we hope that deploying technology will assist us, but we still need to attract folks to uh, the water sector so that they can bring their gifts and talents and passions to help us tackle some of these issues in the most cost-effective ways. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, in so many ways, I, I kind of love the way that you frame these challenges are also in some ways opportunities. Absolutely. And I wonder as, you know, on the horizon, there are, I imagine, new challenges uh, kind of arising all the time. So you already sort of described the three primary challenges that you're up against. But I wonder, like, are there any new challenges that you're already sort of anticipating? Can you talk a little bit about about those? And then also, like, it sounds like so many different folks are coming together to kind of try to holistically address some of these things. Talk a little bit about the importance of that kind of like, you know, camaraderie and differing perspectives coming together to find um, solutions for some of these things as well. Well, I know one thing that um, we're keeping our eyes on uh, is resiliency because the climate challenges that we have can have impacts on our systems. And so we've got to look at how to recover. Uh, so that's another huge focus area for us, but also looking even further into the future. One of the things I'm really excited about uh, to be involved with, with the uh, American Water Works Association is they have a Water 2050 uh, effort where we're challenging ourselves to what does water look like in 2050? And I'll be honest, even if I'm around in 2050, I'm not going to be working at a water utility. So we need to engage with our young professionals and allow them to be a part of the conversation because they're the ones that are going to have to carry this through. So it's nice to have them involved so they, they can hear the thinking and the rationale and the decision making that we're making about what do we look like in 2050? How are things are going to be different? And what do we do now to influ influence that, to make sure that we have a sure footing for um, this vital resource that we all need? Hmm. You know, I've also heard you, Cheryl, talk about um, working with, you know, water professionals sort of in various capacities and ways, but also that you all are working or really trying to make a concerted effort to work with sort of non-traditional partners. Break that down for me a little bit. Who is and what is a non-traditional partner that you're working with at this point? That's the most, that's another exciting piece to the Water 2050 is allowing us to have conversations with people that we don't normally talk to. Um, as most uh, industries, you can be pretty close knit. And you, if you have a nexus to us and we see that nexus, you're involved in the conversation. But with the Water 20 initiative, what we did was expanded our horizon. We started talking to planners. They build uh, communities 
they think about how that that needs to be serviced so we want to engage with them early hey how are you going to get your water services where are they coming from um that if in, in engaging with like urban planners that gives us an opportunity to uh, install things differently from when they were installed and now we operate now. Um, like we can separate our collection system so that storm water is different than the sanitary, the, which we do need to treat. But storm can go straight back to the water body. And why not have the pipes that can do that? And so those are the kinds of conversations that we're having. We're also engaging with, um, with technology. We know that technology is going to be a vital component, but how? Uh, we also have to be concerned with our security, not just the physical security, but also our IT security. We want to, uh, we are concerned about cyber attacks and people getting into our systems and doing things maliciously. We don't want that to happen. So how do we deploy these technologies, incorporate them and still maintain that security and protection that we need um, from uh, those who may not want to do the right things. So we have so many opportunities to talk to others that we don't normally talk to that in, in explaining who we are and how we're involved in their sector, um, power companies that sometimes they use us a lot. I know we're heavily relying on them. So we should talk as to how do we improve our infrastructure together? How do we engage each other so that we're using each other in the best, uh, most efficient ways? So we can't do that until we get in the room and have those conversations and identify uh, our touch points and then help each other so that we can have this sustainable future, not only just for water, but for other things that we know uh, folks are going to need as we uh, live toward the future. Hmm. And, you know, PFAS is another issue, PFAS, <laughs> not only in drinking water, but also in wastewater. Um, I wonder to kind of pivot and get into the PFAS topic a bit. Um, how are you and sort of collectively AWWA thinking about that issue? Well, that's a prime example of one of those things where it's better to keep it out than for us to try to figure out how to treat it out. So PFAS is a new subject. And one of the things that we as water professionals are mostly uh, concerned with are which are the ones that have the most adverse health effects. And that's where our health professionals need to come in and help us uh, with explaining where we need to focus um, because there are so many PFOS compounds. Uh, it's almost uh, scary how much PFOS is around us and how involved it is in our environments. And so we are focused on, okay, let's where, where is it? Which are the ones that we need to be most concerned about? How do we treat for that? And then we're also working on how do we keep it out? Uh, so it, it, it doesn't continue to impact our systems. Uh, so again, lots of conversation, bringing people together. We want to uh, influence the policy around it too. We don't want them to just arbitrarily give us something and then uh, we spend all this money and, and it, do, it, it isn't effective. So we do want to spend some time looking at it so that we are doing those things that will bring the best benefit. Uh, it's always our intention to make sure that this uh, the communities we serve have safe drinking water. That is our primary objective. And we want to protect um, public health as we do that. So we are concerned about these emerging contaminants and we are keeping our eye on those, um, trying to look at advancements in our treatment technology. One of the things that I'm also very grateful about is that we have a research sector in AWWA. So we can have people go and explore and study our challenges and give us the best step forward on how to meet those challenges as they arise. And so as they are surfacing, as we're having these conversations with our research professionals, they can give us information so we know exactly how to adjust our systems to make sure that we are uh, achieving that task each and every day of providing safe water to the communities that we serve.
Hmm. You know, you've mentioned public health a few times so far in our conversation. And I wonder, um, I feel like so many more people are starting to think about public health in relation to environmental health. And I mm-hmm. wonder, um, do you view those things as one in the same? Um, are they? And how do you sort of like reconcile those things in the work that you do? I, I see them one in the same. Um, water is coming from the environment in my mind. So it's imperative that we protect the environment that water is in along with the water. Uh, so I, I see them the, the same. We, we have a responsibility to do both. Uh, so when I look at our, our uh, Great Lakes Water Authority, um, when I'm thinking about doing something or if, if there's a regulatory change, when I study it, I look to see what kind of impact is that going to have on the wastewater side, because I don't want to do something that's going to adversely affect them. Uh, one of the challenges that we were faced with, uh, we at the water treatment facilities had to start processing our own sludge because it was having a negative impact on my sewer partners. And so we had to put in that infrastructure again always moving toward uh, ensuring that we're protecting water quality and they have a responsibility because again they're treating the water so that we are not harming the environment so i don't want to make their job more difficult uh so for me the environment and uh, and since water comes from the environment whether you're sur- source water groundwater it doesn't matter it's touching the environment so they're kind of one and the same and we have a responsibility to protect both and i think advocating with our communities for them to help us with this uh, uh, so that we all are working toward that same common goal. Mm, Cool. And, you know, sort of speaking on, uh, or you already kind of mentioning goals right there, I do kind of want to get back and ask you, you know, what kinds of things has AWWA already initiated or been working on that you're really excited about continuing? And then I wonder, you know, what kinds of new things are you looking forward to being able to implement and incorporate? Um, Well, I mentioned Water 2050. Mm -hmm. We also um, are strengthening our engagement with our young professionals to, again, ensure that future. And we're kind of doing that through the Water 2050 effort with some additions. Um, We just recently uh, deployed our new strategic plan. And the way I see the strategic plan, that's like five year snippets of how we're engaging in order to uh, achieve what we are really looking to do with the Water 2050 effort. So when I look at our new strategic plan, one of the things that we changed is advancing diversity, equity and inclusion and belonging. And belonging really resonates with me um, because I am a non-traditional water professional. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a white male. <laughs> I'm a chemist and I'm a black female. So, uh, but I had a place in the, and, and I've had a very successful water career. So I want to talk to our non-traditional professionals to let them know that they have a place in this water world. And we are also striving in other areas that may not necessarily always be clearly seen. I am fortunate to be coming from a regional authority, so we have more resources than maybe smaller systems would have, but we still need our financial partners to help us um, uh, so that we're doing the right things and accounting for how we're doing our capital investments and our budgets. We need communicators to uh, um, get me out of my lingo and my and, <laughs> and, and where I have a tendency. So I know that I'm speaking clear and plainly so people can understand exactly what it is that we're doing and having that uh, better community engagement. We also need IT professionals. I mentioned that we're concerned about the cybersecurity, but that's not our expertise. We're really focused on water treatment. So we have to bring in these other expertise in the water sector. They have a place, they have a role in helping us to achieve our ultimate task of making sure that we are providing safe drinking water uh, uh, f- uh, for the communities we serve. So. Uh, lots of opportunities. I, I, I hope that as the first black female that I'm an inspiration to other African Americans to get involved, 
to, this is your way to give back and to um, help your own community more directly. Uh, uh, we have mechanics that fix stuff. We have um, the skilled trades, electricians that have to help us keep the power on so that we can continue to pump and treat the water that we need to do. There's so much room uh, for uh, different professions in our sector, and we want to engage with them to let them know that we uh, exist and they have a place and they belong. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for all of that. And especially for really speaking um, so honestly and candidly about the, the role that your identity and your lived experience, um, how that is informing and shaping the way that you show up for this position. And I can't help but sort of hear everything you're saying and be like, wow, Cheryl's really like... <laughs> visioning and thinking about being a connector and bringing so many different people together because this is, I mean, we all need water and it yeah. touches so many different sectors. So thank you for that. Um, you know, as we kind of start to round things out now, I want to ask you a little bit about some of what is keeping you hopeful and energized as you continue doing this work, because it sounds like a big job. It's huge, but I have to say that I'm I'm truly enjoying myself. Uh, as the president, I have an opportunity to go and to visit with sections and and to engage with our international partners, and it's so refreshing to see the energy uh, and the passion that we all have about this vital resource that we're trying to protect. Uh, so just in, having that opportunity to to meet people and engage with them on that commonality that we have, whether it's the opportunity through the challenges that we face, or whether it's engaging with young professionals who uh, we're not very good about showing folks that we exist and and that there is an opportunity here that if you want to uh, have a way of giving back to your community, bringing your gifts and talents to us is a, is a way to do that. Uh, so all the opportunities that I get to engage with people and tell our story around water, why we exist, why we do what we do and how that's important and vital uh, for our future, that's, that's what keeps me hopeful. Uh, and then I love how the light bulb goes off when I do a tour or when I talk to people about water and they uh, have a realization that there's people out there who are making sure that this is provided and and uh, they're the unsung heroes. They're not seen, they're not celebrated, but they're there and they're providing that resource to you. And I want that to, to resonate with folks. And then I want them to think about their engagement with water. What are you doing uh, to uh, make sure that you are helping us protect this vital resource. Are you gardening responsibly? Do you make sure that you don't put your medications down um, uh, the, the toilet or in the sewer? Because again, it's so much easier to keep it out than it is to try to treat it out. So every opportunity that I get to talk about water and uh, to engage with people who, whether they're in the sector or whether they're not, I, I think that is the thing that keeps me most hopeful because I know that this is a vital resource that we all need and that we uh, should feel a sense of value and uh, to want to protect. And I, I, any way that I can communicate that to, to bring that out of folks, I've really want. Uh, I, I love that I have the opportunity to really do it, especially as a WWA president. Absolutely. All right. Well, Cheryl, I wonder if you have any last parting words of wisdom for folks or just anything else that you want to touch on that we didn't get to. Maybe you could also mention where folks can learn more about AWWA if they're interested. Oh, we are always looking for uh, volunteers and getting folks involved and connecting with the water sector. We do have a website. It's awwa.org. Um, feel free to find out more information about us. Um, and just, I, I just want people to think about uh, when they're in their homes and how they are connecting with with water or when they go on vacation, uh, if they happen to be at a beach or, um, you know, just just be conscious and aware of this uh, environment that we're in and do your part to help protect it. Um, we all have a role and we're getting better at communicating on how uh, folks uh, all over can help us um, achieve our ultimate task. 
Awesome. All right. Well, Cheryl Porter, head of the American Water Works Association, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and joining us over here at Great Lakes now. I really appreciate it. Thank you.